enter Alcibiades in through the front door of Agathon's house and into the symposium late at night after the speeches have been given. This is like the after party party. And this is, as we all know, this is where the good times really happen. And of course, Alci what's the little plot overview here is Alcibiades will enter and then he will have this exchange in which he talks about Socrates. He praises Socrates. And then there is a subsequent discussion that Aristotomus says that he fell asleep and doesn't remember everything that was said. And that becomes part of the central mystery of what really happened at this symposium. Right? And it, it's left for us to infer and think about it based on what Plato has given to us. He's given us a lot of cues and clues. Alcibiades was not part of this formal competition to praise Eros. And in fact, instead of praising Eros, he praises Socrates. Because Socrates has had this magnetic effect on everybody, including Alcibiades, and this will be amusing in a second. And uh, he celebrates the effects of Socrates on him. Socrates is not love itself. He is the object of love. He provokes Eros. He is the end rather than the means, right? And this is almost her her heretical or her her impious. We're supposed to be giving praise to a god, and there are expectations about public discourse in ancient Greece that you don't speak ill of the gods. Um, there are laws surrounding surrounding it. If you read the Apology of Socrates, you see that. So this is an impious thing to displace Eros and put Socrates at the center. So there are two mysteries. One is what they talk about at the very end of the dialogue. And the other mystery is what is who is Socrates? What is inside him? Right? Arist Alcibiades is going to explain his attempted courtship of Socrates. Let's be clear. Alcibiades is a person who is very clever, very intelligent. But he, he, So this is interesting. This whole interest in philosophy... It doesn't necessarily just have to do with intelligence that one would want to spend one time thinking about the order of things and so on and so forth. It has to do with what your disposition is. Alcibiades is a brilliant guy. He's incredibly intelligent. He's incredibly just kind of has a native sense. Um, but he is a person more of the body and more of the the worldly realm. He's concerned with things like reputation and um uh, he 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 was like the JFK or the JFK Jr. of the his day. Incredibly charismatic, incredibly handsome, incredibly popular. Uh, he was a political and military figure. Uh, uh, he is a central figure in the Peloponnesian War, and uh, when he lost uh, badly in the Sicilian expedition, uh, which was the basically the defeat that spelled the demise of. Uh, Athens and her empire. He actually fled to Persia and took up with the enemy and did some really unusual things. And he is, if he's nothing else, he's an individual. Now we remember the relationship between the lover and the beloved. The lover is the old man. They pursue the young man because they are young and beautiful. There's acclaimed mentorship and so on and so forth. But what they may just be after is so if you think about it, if the old man is a righteous person, he's actually something like a teacher, right? And maybe there's actually no sexual relationship at all. Maybe the real relationship is a genuine mentorship, right? That possibility is lurking there. But Pausanias can't get away from sex because that's in his conversation, because that actually just seems to be what he wants, right? What does the older man want from the younger man, which is to say, what does the younger man actually have to offer the older man? It's the beauty of youth, right? Look what happens here. It's the younger, handsome man, acknowledged, objectively handsome, pursuing Socrates, older and ugly in an erotic way. The whole roles are reversed. And there's something hilarious about that. And Alcibiades is 
basically livid. This is a this is a very confident kind of cocksure man, a narcissistic man. He's used to getting what he wants from people because he's powerful, because he's handsome, because he has reputation, and things just fall into his lap, right? He pursues the older man who is truly ugly, and this should be an easy mark, right? And what he's so irritated is that none of the charms that he has affect Socrates in any way. Socrates is utterly indifferent to Alcibiades' very explicit erotic advances. And that's because Alcibiades fun fundamentally does not understand Socrates. He cannot understand Socrates fully because one has interest in this worldly things, the things of the body, the things of worldly success, and Socrates is simply fundamentally in, indifferent to those things and dedicated to this higher realm. And of course, it actually suggests that Socrates does not appear to have any clear interest in sex. Um, I think Alcibiades sees Socrates spending time with the youth, right? Uh, he was a teacher. He taught younger people. And that's evident in every Platonic dialogue, in the charges against him in the Apology. He is accused of corrupting the youth, giving them bad ideas, rebellious ideas in their own society. Um, I think people who saw that of a more conventional ilk, like Alcibiades, assumed that Socrates was really using teaching as a cover to get access to younger men and for sexual relationships. And why does he think that? I think he thinks that because that's what he would do if he were in that position, because he projects his own motive, as every character does, they project their own motivations onto Socrates. One of the reasons Socrates is so mysterious is because no one can understand quite what he's about, because they're not him, right? So it turns out that Socrates... It is an innocent. He he is that exemplary mentor that uh, Pausanias uh, described, but uh, was not himself a practitioner, right? Okay, so Alcibiades he loves Socrates, but it also makes him livid, right? And just as we see the effects of Eros in people, here we see the effect of Socrates on Alcibiades, and this is now a eulogy not to Eros directly but to Socrates, because he inspires Eros, and the object that inspires Eros is of a higher dignity than Eros itself. Do we see that? It's just kind of a logical consequence. Now look what happens. Socrates gives, we're on page 61, Alcibiades' entrance, right? Uh, Socrates finishes his speech to loud applause, right? A moment later, they heard Alcibiades shouting in the courtyard, very drunk and very loud. He wanted to know where Agathon was. He demanded to see Agathon at once. Actually, he was half carried into the house by the flute girl and by some other companions of his. But at the door, he managed to stand by himself, crowned with a beautiful wreath of violets and ivy and ribbons in his hair. I think he's being presented like the god of Dionysus. Right. And Dionysus, among other things, is like the god of wine and like altered states of mind, the release of the passions. He says, good evening, gentlemen. I'm plastered, he announced. He's drunk. He's in the bag. Right. He's fractured. You get the language? Uh, he announced, may I join your party? Uh, or should I crown Agathon with my wreath? which is all I came to do anyway and make myself scarce. So he was going to give this wreath is, is a symbol of victory. It's a symbol of having won the competition. Agathon is going to receive the wreath because he won the theatrical contest the night before. But Alcibiades doesn't know that Socrates is there, and he stumbles into him, and when he finds out he's there, he's completely freaked out. Right. This is the most human moment in this whole dialogue. I mean, there's a number of good human moments, but this is something we can all relate to. The moment he sees Socrates there, he's both erotically attracted to him, but revolted because he's so frustrated. His his advances to Socrates have been so frustrated because he can't understand why Socrates doesn't succumb to his advances. He doesn't get it. It's not that Socrates is being virtuous. Socrates just doesn't care. And he can't imagine no one would care about his advances. Just he can't conceive of it. 
It's like Harvey Weinstein, someone just saying, I don't care about your advances. Um, and when he realizes Socrates is there, he realizes that Socrates is going to deserve the crown because he knows Alcibiades, at the very least, is a good enough judge. It's all about judging a competition here. Good enough judge to know Alcib that Socrates is the superior man. He says, I really couldn't make it yesterday. He couldn't make it to the celebration for Agathon yesterday. He continued, but nothing could stop me tonight. See, I'm wearing the garland myself. I want this crown to come directly from my head to the head that be head that belongs. To my head to the head that belongs. I don't mind saying to the cleverest and best looking man in town. Now, does he really mean that? I think the answer is no. He's actually lying. But he's playing along with the fact that this guy just won a great competition. He's flattering him to a certain extent. The best-looking man, Agathon, his name literally means good. In the introductory dialogue, we see him described as a good-looking man. Socrates is going to the house of a good-looking man. Here's, a, here's another pun, this issue of good-looking. Uh, Agathon appears good, but he is not, he's not bad, but he's not excellent. As, he's not as excellent as Socrates. Right. So he only good looking can be interpreted either as handsome looking or it can be interpreted as as he appears good, but he is not as good as he really appears. Right. You see that or as excellent as he appears. Who is the real good looking man? Well, it's Socrates, of course. Well, maybe he doesn't just look good. He is good. In fact, he looks pretty ugly. Right. On page 62, Alcibiades stumbles into Socrates. Middle of the page, Agathon asked his slaves to take Alcibiades' sandals off. Uh, we can all three fit on my couch, he says. What a good idea, Alcibiades replied. But wait a moment. We can all three. Who's the third? Who's sitting next to Agathon? You remember that from the introductory dialogue? As he said this, he turned around, and it was only then that he saw Socrates. No sooner had he seen him than he leapt up and cried, Good Lord, what's going on here? It's Socrates. You've trapped me again. You always do this to me. All of a sudden, you'll turn up out of nowhere when I least expect you. Well, what do you want, in, what do you want now? Why do you choose this particular couch? Actually, he didn't. Agathon told him to come there. So this is just, this response is hilarious, right? And he's drunk and he's flustered. Um, and he's perplexed by Socrates because he's got a magnetic attraction to Socrates. And then, on another hand, he's been repelled by Socrates. So he's, he's frustrated. He's in conflict. Why aren't you with Aristophanes or anyone else who could tease you about? But no, you figured out a way to find a place next to the most handsome man in the room. And of course, this is a play on good looking. We have to keep that in mind. I beg you, Agathon, said Socrates, protect me from this man. You can't imagine what it's like to be in love with him, or rather for Alcibiades to be in love with Socrates. From the first moment he realized about how I felt, how I felt about him, he hasn't allowed me to say two words to anybody else. Uh, what? What am I to say? What am I what am I saying? I can't so much as look at an attractive man, but he flees into a fit of jealous rage. So the question is, he says, once Alcibiades discovered how I felt about him, uh he he's possessive, possessive, jealous rage, right? We see the effects of Eros, right? And the question is, what does Socrates really feel about him? And it's actually not a very high opinion, despite that Alcibiades is the man of greatest repute in Athenian society at the time, just about. He yells, he threatens, he can hardly keep from slapping me around. Please try to keep him under control. Could you ever make him forgive me? Uh, and if you can't, if he gets violent, will you defend me? The fiercest of his passions terrify me. Now, there's a question about how, you know, serious he's making these charges. There's clearly some truth to them, but he might be a little uh, hyperbolic here as well. It's really, it's, it's hard to say how hyperbolic. I shall never forgive you, Alcibiades cried. I promise you'll pay for this. 
But for the moment, he said, turning to Agathon, give me some of these ribbons. I better make a wreath for him as well. Look at that magnificent head. Otherwise I know he'll make a scene. He'll be grumbling that though I crowned you for your first victory, I didn't honor even uh, didn't honor him, even though he has never lost an argument in his life. So then on on page 63, there's an interesting discussion of drinking. And here the high and low capacity, the he heavyweights and the lightweight drinkers come into play. Um, Alcibiades orders that the, the wine pitchers, be the wine cups be filled up so they can drink. And he fills them up a lot. And then he talks. So this is a bi biography. What we really get here is a biography of Socrates from the point of view of Alcibiades. And he says, Socrates can drink nothing and he's fine, and he doesn't have a desire for alcohol, or he can drink a boatload, and he never shows signs of inebriation. He's indifferent to it, right? And that's irritating, again, to Alcibiades, because what, do you, what, he, what does he want to see from Socrates? He wants to see this guy let go. He wants to see the true Socrates. He wants to see one, what's underneath it all. And uh, everyone else, um, they have a threshold in which they kind of lose it, and their identity comes out and Socrates is always he always has this rational restraint and I think the problem is it's not that he tries to have that it's just that that's the way he is he is and that actually makes him alien to us we um, Nietzsche in the birth of tragedy has some interesting critical things to say about Socrates that uh, and even Plato in um, in some of the deathbed scenes where he has to drink the hemlock uh, that there is a certain domain of the human experience, particularly connected with the passions, that Socrates cannot understand and cannot appreciate. And it has to do with things like poetry, actually. He speaks in a way that's very ugly, this argumentative stuff that's constantly prying into truth and uh, knocking down other people's opinions. is You can't behave that way in public. I mean... You can have a concern for the truth, but you have to tread, you have to have respect for other people's opinions because you want to have respect for them. And he doesn't care about any of that. He's really indifferent to it all. And yet those people uh, are still attracted to him. So we turn to the speech, just a few more minutes here, the, the speech of Alcibiades proper on page 65, right? And the central mystery of the symposium is no longer about Eros. It is now about Socrates. He is the central mystery, uh, the, the being who's shrouded and concealed. Like, he is famous for his irony. Irony is saying the opposite of what you mean. And irony is a technique of concealing what's really, what you're really thinking and what's really going on inside you. So, Socrates has a public policy of concealing uh, maybe his most important thoughts. And it seems to me Alcibiades, as part of his erotic uh, attraction to Socrates, he wants to know what's really going on with Socrates, and he can't get access to it. And it makes him livid, makes him livid. So to explain how he understands Socrates, he uses, he says, I'm going to use an image. It's a kind of allegory. It's a metaphor or analogy to explain what he's like. And he says he's just like these little statues of these satyrs called Selenus. Satyr is this kind of goat-like figure in Greek mythology that lives out in the woods and is wild and gives into its passions and lives this kind of rambunctious, uh, semi-uncivilized and very sexualized life. And uh, at little uh, kiosks connected with the theater, they, they sell these little statues of Selenus. And when you open them up, and Selenus, actually, if you see sculptures of Selenus, Selenus is very ugly, and they look a lot like the sculptures of uh, Socrates, right? So the Selenus on the outside is ugly, and he says when you open it up, it uh, it has a, a gold inside of it. And this is just this metaphor of appearance and reality, that on the outside, Socrates doesn't bathe, he doesn't wear shoes, he doesn't wear clean clothes, maybe. Um, he doesn't care about how he looks, and he doesn't care what other people think about how he looks. And he's ugly, he's he's fugly, but on the inside, he is the, the most decent, he has the most excellent soul of all human beings. And if what we most are as human beings is our soul, or the intellect in our soul, then Socrates is the best human being, right? I mean... This hierarchical competitive attitude is something that 
you know, at least on the surface of our society, we just, we, we can't handle, we're, we're all have to be equal. We can't judge and compare people. What's lovely about reading this is that they have no problem with comparing each other, and putting each other in their place, the way people do around behind closed doors in particular. It says, here's an image. I'll try to praise, I'll try to praise Socrates. That is the first uh, phrase of the first sentence. So this is kind of heretical. He's displaced the whole uh, praising of a god. Is Socrates kind of like a god? Well, in a sense, he is, because here he is. He's a character. He's now a myth in this book, and he's elevated like above the ordinary humanity, right? Just as a con he's a, he's a concept. Isn't he just like a statue of Silenus? You know, the kind of statue I mean. Uh, you'll find them in any shop in town. It's a Silenus sitting uh, his flute or his pipes in his hand and it's hollow. It's hollow. It's split right down the middle and inside it's full of tiny statues uh, of the gods. Now look at him. And isn't he also just like the satyr Mar Marseus? Uh, Marcius. So uh, the Silenus has the flute and what does he do with it and his instruments he seduces people or he influences people socrates's instrument is not a flute it's his mind and the speech right is his um tool of seduction but of course it's not erotic seduction um alcibiades is going to describe how he was snake bitten by socrates and it's painful he's bitten in his heart um why is this uh because socrates is in intrinsically intriguing uh but and so therefore people are attracted to him but socrates is not attracted to them because what is he attracted to he's made it very clear in his speech he's attracted to understanding the order of things in their underlying forms in their kind of pure pattern of reality that transcends the fluctuations of the or, or everyday life the mortal world and therefore while he connects with other people in order to talk about those things they're just a means he, we might even say he's using them just for the sake of conversation and they get a lot more from him in his quest for wisdom and the truth than he gets from them right it's not that he gets nothing from them but it's always a disproportionate exchange it's not it's not commensurate it's not equal so therefore, he just doesn't, he, he, he's happy to have them around, but he doesn't care about them that much. We've seen that he's capable of being self-sufficient, just thinking on his own. He doesn't need to spend time with them. So here the satyr on page 66, become, and his satyr and his flute and his effect becomes clear. This is all a metaphor, right? We, we have to learn to think metaphorically. The symposium cannot be appreciated at all if you can't think metaphorically that these are symbols that need interpretation and have analogs that are intelligible in real life. If I were to describe for you what an extraordinary effect his words have always, um, have always had on me, I can feel it at this moment even as I'm speaking. You might actually suspect that I'm drunk. Still, I swear to you, the moment he starts to speak, I am beside myself. My heart sits, leaping, starts leaping in my chest. The tears come streaming down my face. Even the frenzied Corbantes uh, seem sane compared to me. And let me tell you, I am not alone. I have heard Pericles and many other great orators, and I have admired their speeches. Uh, Pericles was the great politician of Athens during the period of the Peloponnesian War the leader of the of the city but nothing like this ever happened to me they never upset me so deeply that my very own soul started protesting that my life my life's my life was no better than the most miserable slave right so he becomes aware that socrates has something that makes him feel utterly insignificant he recognizes Socrates' superiority, right? Because he actually appreciates what Socrates is saying, and it has an effect on him. And in having an effect on him, he realizes what Socrates is doing with his life is actually superior to his own, because he's seeking reputation and he's all the conventional things. It says he, I'm going to skip down a little bit at 67. It says, he always traps me, you see, and he makes me admit 
that my political career is a waste of time, while all that matters is just what I most neglect, my personal shortcomings, which cry out for, for the closest attention. So I refuse to listen to him. I stop my ears and tear myself away from him, for like the sirens, he could make me stay by his side till I die. So, I mean, Aristotle is pretty clear about the political life. It's about, I mean, he, he characterizes it as kind of a narcissism. The people who are not good in character pursue the attention of others to flee, to have them flee from themselves. So every time Socrates is self-sufficient, he has self-love. He, he might even be the model for Aristotle's self-love in Book 9 of the uh, Nicomachean Ethics. Whereas uh, when pe other people see this, they become aware of their own deficiencies. And they both love Socrates in their admiration, but their admiration is really a recognition of their own inferiority. And he's actually honest enough to recognize this because he feels it palpably. Socrates is the only man in the world who has made me feel shame. This man is particularly shameless. Ah, uh, you didn't think I had it in me, did you? Yes, he makes me feel ashamed. Now think about what relationships are all about and being concerned, going back to Phaedrus and Pausanias, being concerned about with the opinion of the person you love and feeling shame and inspiring you to do the right thing. I know perfectly well that I can't prove he's wrong when he tells me what I should do, yet the moment I leave his side, I go back to my old waves. I cave in to my desire to please the crowd. Right? So... He, he should be concerned with himself. He, he wants to please others because he wants their attention. Socrates doesn't care. So it says, My whole life has become one constant effort to escape from him and keep and keep away. But when I see him, I feel deeply ashamed. So he was literally not expecting to see him on this night. And then Socrates happens to be there and he jumps up in a start. He says, Not again! He's found me again! And it does... Okay, so let's just pick up with page 66, where we get a very intimate description of the interaction between Alcibiades and Socrates that both show who these two people are in their fundamental differences, concerned with bodily and worldly goods versus goods of the soul, and also the frustration this causes for Alcibiades. And this is actually really hilarious. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think what's interesting is that it's 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 fascinating, and you see this in a lot of um, uh, in late Greek comedy. The comedies were very often love stories, and humor and lightheartedness, levity connected with love and the folly of love, the craziness that love produces. You see that in Socrates' plays, all all of excuse me, uh, Shakespeare's plays, all of his comedies. Uh, the, the central theme is love and the, the folly. Uh, re re remember what Pausanias said, that uh, when people are in love, they do crazy stuff, cray-cray stuff. And actually, because we all know that love can inspire those intense feelings, we actually accept, at least within that con the confines of that context, that people act that way, and it's understandable. 68. To begin with, he's crazy about beautiful boys. He constantly follows them around in a perpetual daze. Also, he likes to say he's ignorant and knows nothing. Isn't that just like Solanus? Of course it is. And all of this is just on the surface, like the outsides of those statues. I wonder, my fellow drinkers, if you have any idea what a sober and temperate man uh, he proves to be once you have looked inside. Believe me, it couldn't matter less to him whether a boy is beautiful. So he's just undermined his own point. He says he goes around uh, after beautiful boys, uh, young men, uh, in, in a perpetual daze. But then he acknowledges that he's utterly indifferent to the appearances of the boys. And, I mean, Socrates actually is, does not appear, it's not explicitly stated, but he does not appear to be interested in sex at all. And this is part of uh, why he's so alien to most of us. And it's not, not that he has any negative feeling. You know, let's be clear. When the Greeks demote sexual love, love of the body, it's not because they're treating it as sinful. This is not a Christian context. Jesus Christ doesn't even exist. 
right? And and even the those um, the the screeds against human sexuality or or later developments, uh, original sin and the, the the sinfulness of the body. It's not that there's anything wrong with sexual love in and of itself. It's just that it exists in a subordinated place within the hierarchy of human goods. I mean, we saw that in Aristotle, and it's no different with Socrates. And you can see where Aristotle took his ideas because he was a student of Plato. Um, you can't imagine how little he cares whether a person is beautiful or rich or famous in any other way that most people admire. There it is. There it is. He doesn't care about what people conventionally think is important because he wants to look into the nature of things and determine what he thinks is truly important, right? And the point is we mistake the appearance for the reality. And of course Socrates is concerned about beauty, but he's concerned about a different type of beauty. It's uh, the book, not the cover. He considers all these possessions beneath contempt, and that's why he dresses and acts the way he does. And that's exactly how he considers all of us as well, because all of us is the average person who's pursuing these things, right? In pl public, I tell you, his whole life is one big game of irony. I don't know if any of you have ever seen him when he's really serious, but I once caught him when he was open like Selenus's statues, and I had a glimpse of the figures he keeps held within. They were so godlike, so bright and beautiful, so utterly amazing, that I no longer had a choice. I just had to do whatever he told me. Now, you notice Socrates is not going to abuse this power, and I don't even think Socrates wants it, because Socrates... To, to put it in the religious language, he's concerned with saving his own soul or perfecting his own soul. Your soul is your business. You should, from his point of view, you should be trying to do what he's doing. And that you will not, maybe what's being lurking here is you will not find completion in the other person. You must complete yourself. And if you think you're going to be completed by another person, you're fooling yourself because that is not the proper object. Other people may be instrumental, but they themselves are not the act of completion. In public, I tell you, it's all, all right, so we read that. Uh, what I thought at the time, what I thought, which means wasn't the reality, what I thought at the time was that he really, wh what he really wanted was me. Of course, that's Alcibiades' projection on Socrates. Um, and this is also why Alcibiades was so irritated when he found out what he really wanted was not him. Because Socrates has a disarming way of getting everyone to be infatuated with him. And that shows all the signs to the conventional person of someone who's using their charisma to get, you know, favors from other people. And that seemed to me the luckiest coincidence. All I had to do was to let him have his way with me. And that has a sexual connotation. And he would teach me everything he knew. Believe me, I had a lot of confidence in my looks. Now you see the point? Socrates doesn't care about your looks, doesn't care about your money, doesn't care about your prestige. He really is just fundamentally indifferent. It's not like he has to try, right? He's not putting on a show here. Naturally, up to that time, we were never alone together. One of my attendants had always been present. Now, this is talking about the past, when Alcib because he's known Socrates for a while now. And not sure exactly how old Alcibiades is here, but he may be in his well into his 30s. And this sounds like a time when he was a young man. He was close to being that boy young man involved in that pederastic relationship. So remember, the attendants are there to protect the young man from men's male suitors who are not uh, well-intentioned. But with this in mind, I sent the attendant away. He, he wanted some, you know, he wanted a piece of Socrates and met Socrates alone, right? You can see the situation being set up. You s and, you know, this is male-male. I, I don't know how everybody responds to that. But I have to say that there is obviously a uh, significance in terms of the, 
what's been said about the various orientations and so on and that it's 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 we're not simply dealing with sexual orientation as we understand it today and i think you need to put that aside uh on the one hand there are some uh, how how should i put it symbolic meanings to this um because the male female relationship is understood as being based in the body about procreation and genes and not about the soul um which of course is not the full story of that relationship as we all know the other thing is though it doesn't really matter that this is a male male relationship in many senses what we what we really see is what you know what we would call unrequited love this is one of the great themes of romantic literature one person loves the other and the other person does not reciprocate and having looked at aristotle's definition of friendship we can see exactly why that's so problematic because what should happen from aristotle's point of view in book 9 that relationship should dissolve if our love's not requited but the problem is we keep pursuing we keep pursuing and we harm ourselves in the process. We harm ourselves in the process. Uh, I sent the attendant away and met Socrates alone. You see, in this company, I must tell you the whole truth. So pay attention. And Socrates, if I say anything untrue, I want you to correct me. So there I was, my friends, alone with him at last. And he thinks he's going to get action out of this. Is, this is funny. My idea, naturally was that he'd take advantage of the opportunity to tell me whatever it is that lovers say uh, when they find themselves alone, I relish the moment. Which is, you know, uh, uh, they're macking. They're, they're, they're throwing their stuff out there. They're using their junk. Uh, you know, they're, they're BS. BS artists to get, to get laid. Because that's what he thinks Socrates is. Because that's the only way he can understand what Socrates would do, because that's his point of view. He can't understand a person who would not take advantage. Like, what do they really want? I can't understand what they could want. But no such luck, he says at the bottom of 68. Nothing of the sort occurred. Socrates had his usual sort of conversation with me, and at the end of the day, he went off. So Socrates turns out actually be to be the noble man who talks with younger men or older boys and simply seeks the pleasure of conversation for its own sake and the ideas that are born from it. My next idea was to invite him to the gymnasium. Now what's the gymnasium? That's the place where you exercise in the nude. With me, we took exercise together and I'm sure that this, and I was sure that this would lead to something. I mean, this is pretty explicit, really, if you're reading carefully enough. He took exercise and wrestled with me many times when no one else was present. What else? What can I tell you? I got nowhere. <laughs> when I realized that my ploy had failed. Now notice it's the young boy with the ploy, not the older man. I decided on a frontal attack. I refused to retreat from a battle I myself had begun. Now notice the younger boy is going after the older man. It's supposed to be the other way around because, you know, the, the older guy is supposed to be uh, intrigued by youth. And I needed to know just where matters stood. So when I did, so what I did was to invite him to dinner as if I were his lover and he was my young prey. Well, that's actually the situation they're in. The roles have been completely reversed. <laughs> To tell the truth, it took him quite a while to accept my invitation, but one day he finally arrived. This time he left right after dinner. I was too shy to try and stop. So Socrates has become aware of what Alcibiades is doing, and he's now trying to avoid interactions or encounters that would raise the issue, right? Because he's not interested. Uh, but on my next attempt, I started some discussion just as we were finishing our meal, and he kept and kept him talking late into the night. When he said he should be going, I used the lateness of hour as an excuse and managed to persuade him to spend the night at my house. He had had his meal on the couch next to me, so he just made himself comfortable and laid down on it. No one else was there. <laughs> it's like high school sleepover. Now you must admit that my story so far has been perfectly decent. 
I could have told it in any company. Yeah, because he hasn't given any divulged any dirty details, right? But you'd never have heard me tell the rest of it as you're about to do. Uh, if it weren't that, as the saying goes, there's truth in wine when the slaves have left and when they're present, too. Uh, wine is liquid courage. Also, would it be fair to Socrates for me to praise him and yet to fail to reveal one of his proudest accomplishments? And furthermore, you know what people say about snake bite. That uh, you'll only talk about it with your fellow victims. I think that's, um, you know, I think what he means by snake bite is simply, is simply being smitten by someone. Right. And the whole image of snake bite has this kind of positive and negative connotation. Right. It's it's uh, uh, only they will understand the pain for uh, and forgive, give you all the things it made you do. Right. So love made him crazy or this this impulse made him crazy, this attractive impulse. Well, something much more painful than a snake than a snake has bitten. Excuse me. Well, something much more painful than a snake has bitten me in my most sensitive part. And right, he's not talking about his private parts. He says, of course, you didn't think that. I mean my heart or my soul or wherever you call, want to call call it, uh, which has been struck and bitten by philosophy, whose grip on young and eager souls is much more vicious than a viper's and makes them do the most amazing things. And these are not sexual things. So what we're going to do here is conclude on pages 70 and 71 of this night alone together, right? He's snake bitten, and that's going to be the consequence of the event. But let's, let's this story's juicy, right? We've waited till the end of the book to get the juicy story. The, this drama here has a trajectory that just goes straight up, and the, cli the climax, such as it were, is really right at the end. Um, not typical structure. But it keeps us it keeps us yearning for the goal, right? The erotic desire. To get back to the story, the lights were out, the slaves had left, the time was right, I thought, to come to the point and tell him freely what I had in mind. So notice no explicit mention of sex has been made, and yet that's clearly what he's referring to. So I shook him and whispered, Socrates, are you asleep? No, no, not at all, he replied. You know what I've been thinking? Well, no, not really. I think, I said, this is Alcibiades, you're the only worthy lover I have ever had, and yet, look how shy you are with me. Oh, my goodness. He thinks Socrates is being shy, right? That's a natural conclusion that he's holding back because he doesn't know how to initiate things. The point is, and of course, that's Alcibiades' own high opinion of himself that all along he assumes Socrates wants him and he's just being shy and that's why he's acting reticently. Socrates don't care. He does not care. Uh, you're shy with me. Well, here's how I look at it. It would be really stupid not to give you anything you want. You can have me, my belongings, anything my friends might have. So now here is the young person willing to do anything. <laughs> When it was supposed to be the old person who was willing to do anything, and the young one was supposed to re resist. So now we see the very role reversal that Pausanias uh, laid out as his uh, explanation of this type of relationship unfolded. Nothing is more important to me than becoming the best man I can be. I don't think that's true. We know that's not true. He's actually acknowledged he's not the best man in the symposium itself, because remember he's recounting a, a night with him when he said this. Um, Alcibiades wants to, it's not just that he wants sex, it's that he wants to have conquered the superior man, right? Nothing is more important to me than becoming the best man I can be, and no one can help me more than you to reach this aim. With a man like you, in fact, I'll be much more ashamed of what wise people would say if I did not take you as my lover. He thinks this is all about bodily love. It's about conversation, right? He doesn't get it. And he's not going to get it because it's not who he is, despite his intelligence. Then I would, of all the others in their foolishness, would, 
uh, would say if I did. He heard me out. Then he said, in the absolutely inimitable, ironic manner of his, Dear Alcibiades, if you are right in what you say about me, you are already more accomplished than you think. If I really have in me the power to make you a better man, Socrates doesn't really believe he does. Each person has to make themselves a better man. He might be a midwife for other people making themselves better, but it's not his primary concern. He's concerned with himself, and in the process he lifts other boats. But they still have to do the lifting themselves. Then you can see in me a beauty that is really beyond description. And and think about, this is book nine of the of the ethics to talking about complete friends making each other better and the and the and the challenges encountered in that for various reasons. Then you can see in me a beauty that is really beyond description and makes your own remarkable good looks pale in comparison. Right? Body versus soul, goods of the body versus the soul. But then in this a fair exchange that is this a fair exchange that you propose? Is this a fair exchange you propose? All real friendship for Aristotle is based on an appropriate, equal, commensurate, reciprocal exchange. Socrates ain't getting nothing from Alcibiades. And it's he's offering sex, right? But the problem is, it's not what Socrates wants. It's not what he's interested in. He's indifferent to it. You seem to me to want more than your proper share. You offer me the merest appearance of beauty. That means literally his looks, because that's not real beauty for uh, Socrates, as we know from his speech. And in return, you want the thing itself, gold in exchange for brawn. Now, remember, remember uh, Aristotle in Book 9 of uh, Deception and Self-Deception. He talks about people pretending to offer one thing, but they're really doing another they are engaging in counterfeiting currency, counterfeiting currency. So you're pretending what you're offering me is gold, but it's really just bronze in the order of things. Still, my boy, you should think twice because you could be wrong and I may be of no use to you. The mind's sight becomes sharp only when the body's eyes go past their prime. And you are still a good long time away from that. When when I heard this, I replied, I really have nothing more to say. I've told you exactly what I think. Now it's your turn to consider what you think best for you and me. So now, you know, uh, Alcibiades has put forward his, his I, I, I want to be with you. and I mean, kind of be, I want you to be my mentor lo slash lover. You see the boundaries are very blurred here. And now, since he's proposed this, he's been courageous enough to say it. Now Socrates has to say his bit. You're right about that, he answered. In the future, let's consider things together. We always do, uh, we'll always do what seems the best uh, to the two of us. His words made me think that my own, that my own had finally hit their mark, that he was smitten by my arrows, right? Just like Cupid, right? And what, what is he, he thinks he's gotten the con confession. I mean, it's a subtle one at that but that Socrates is willing to reciprocate in, in, in what, in the relationship that Alcibiades is pursuing. I didn't give him a chance to say another word. I stood up immediately and placed my mantle over the light cloak, which, though it was in the middle of winter, uh, was his only clothing. I slipped underneath the cloak and put my arm around this man, this utterly unnatural, this truly, he, he is unnatural. We can't relate to him. He doesn't have the natural, which is to say the ordinary concerns, the common concerns of the human being. This truly extraordinary man and spent the whole night next to him. He's got his arm as a ram rhythm and he's just got a cloak on, right? He's like virtually semi-naked. Socrates, you can't deny a word of it, but in spite of all my efforts, this hopelessly arrogant, this unbelievably insolent man, he turned me down. Now, the claim is that he was haughty and insolent because he turned him down. And that this was a kind of standoff of pride. and Like, you're not going to have me. I'm above you. It's in that, And that still reflects on Alcibiades' unwillingness to acknowledge that Socrates just doesn't care. Because he can't acknowledge that someone else actually doesn't care about his high status. You see this with politicians all the time. We're like, we're supposed to care about what they say and 
and their the new album and they act as if it's like the world revolves around them and we couldn't care less he spurned my beauty because it's beauty of the body of which i was so proud members and it's you know beauty of the body is a fleeting thing well what happens when he's old members of the jury he's speaking to everyone else, for this is really what you are you are here to sit in judgment of Socrates' amazing arrogance and pride. Be sure of it. I swear to you by all the gods and goddesses together, my night with Socrates went no further than if I had spent it with my own father or older brother. Right. So the assumption is the moment you get someone in this context, duh, something's going to happen. And the same with this symposium. You get people drunk in this private context and you assume something sexual is going to happen. And, and you know, this is one of the big reveals of the symposium is it's like, it doesn't happen. My God, what kind of people, what kind of people would not do something, right? I mean, come on. Uh, how do you think uh, I felt after that? Of course, I was deeply humiliated but also I couldn't help admiring his natural character. His moderation was not affected or forced. It's just the way he is. His fortitude, so that's moderation, form of courage. Uh, here was a man whose strength and wisdom went beyond my wildest dreams. See, he can't imagine. An, an old, so he's probably been around other old guys who, you know, could be, he got what he wanted. How could I bring, and of course, he wants him more precisely because he can't have him, but like, it's all about the reason that Socrates is not interested in him. That's, that makes a big difference. But how could I possibly win him over? I knew very well that money meant much less to him than enemy weapons ever meant to Ajax, and the only trap by means of which I had, I had thought I might capture him had already proven a dismal failure. Uh, I had no idea what to do no purpose in life ah uh, no one else ever has ever known the real meaning of slavery so remember the servitude thing why is he in servitude to him because yeah. he he's in servitude because he's met his superior and i mean we're naturally attracted to that which is excellent so let's conclude what we've discovered is the symposium is not really an ode to Eros as such. I, th that's an overstatement. Let's just say the, the, the primary celebration, the primary eulogy is being given to Socrates. On page 74, he says, But as a whole, he, Socrates, is unique. He is like no one else in the past and no one in the present. This is by far the most amazing thing about him. For we might be able to form an idea of what Achilles was like by comparing him to Brasidas or some other great warrior, or we might compare Pericles with Nestor or Antinor or one of the great other orate, one of the other great orators. This is a parallel for everyone, everyone else, that is, but this man here is so bizarre. His ideas, his ways and ideas are so unusual that search as you might, you'll never find anyone else alive or dead who's even remotely like him. He is alien. The best you can, you can do is to not compare him to anything human, but to liken him, as I do, to Selenus and the satyrs. And that goes for his ideas and his arguments. It says, come to think of it, I should have mentioned this much earlier. Even his ideas and arguments are just like those hollow say, statues of Selenus. If you were to listen to his arguments, at first they'd strike you as totally ridiculous. They're clothed in words as coarse as the hides worn by the most vulgar satyrs. He's always going on about pack asses or blacksmiths or cobblers or tanners. He's always making the same tired points and the same tired old words. If you're foolish or simply unfamiliar with him, you'd find it impossible not to laugh at his arguments. But if you see them when they open up, like the statues, if you go behind their surface, you'll realize that no other arguments make any sense. 
they're truly worthy of a god bursting with figures of virtue inside they're of great no of the greatest importance for anyone who wants to become a truly good man <laughs>